Okay, I had um, titled this, uh, this third lecture, uh, Observational Prospects, uh, and I'm just going to talk a, a fair amount about aspects of, uh, of survey design um, and, uh, and about upcoming surveys uh, as well as recent surveys. Because I'm running fairly far behind on, on material from, uh, from yesterday, I've decided to, to cut back uh, a fair amount of, uh, of what would have gone in today, and, and mostly uh, cover the, the baryon acoustic oscillation uh, material that I plan for, uh, for today's lecture. Um, but to, uh, to begin by returning to what I was uh, talking about yesterday, about modeling galaxy clustering, uh, and then uh, I hope after a discussion of BAO, uh, if there's time, I'll come back and say some more uh, about the Lyman Alpha Forest, um, but the discussion of BAO will bring up some of the, the sort of general points about, uh, about survey design. So uh, this little uh, film clip I'm, I'm showing here is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, which has produced uh, many of the uh, major galaxy clustering uh, data sets uh, that we're currently using. And uh, I started working on the Sloan Survey in 1992 when I was a, a postdoc, um, and at that point we were doing design and, uh, and then moving towards construction. Uh, the survey had its first light data in 1998 and kind of began full operations uh, around 2000, um, and that was when we started really being able to do science with the data, uh, and then it's been through several phases since then. So 2005, we started a second phase called SDSS2, um, and uh, I was the project spokesperson for that. Uh, and then from 2008 to 2014, uh, had a phase called SDSS3, uh, of which uh, in, uh, for this group, the survey you've probably, you're most likely to have heard about is the one called BOSS, the Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, and I'll be showing you results from that uh, later today. Um, and the... Uh, uh, and I've been the project scientist for SDSS3, and now we're on to SDSS4, which I'm still involved with, but not, not quite so heavily. Uh, this is just a, a time lapse uh, of one night at the SDSS telescope. So the SDSS uh, did imaging of the sky through a giant mosaic camera shown here, along with Jim Gunn, who was my thesis advisor and was also the, uh, you know, the person who really uh, made the SDF more than any other single person uh, out of the hundreds who were involved. Jim is uh, the one without whom the whole thing couldn't have happened. Uh, but now uh, SDSS is mostly is, uh, is doing spectroscopy, uh, so it's measuring the redshifts uh, of galaxies and the spectra of quasars and stars through fibers that are plugged into plates. Um, those, uh, uh, and so there are cartridges that get mounted on the back of the telescope uh, and light goes uh, onto the plate, down the holes, through the fibers, uh, to the spectrographs to measure the redshifts. So what you see is, uh, you know, these periods when the telescope is pointing at something um, and collecting light and measuring all those redshifts. Uh, and then there's a period when someone has to go out, take one cartridge off the telescope, put another one on. Um, and then it gets repointed somewhere else. There are some calibration observations and then it uh, points that way for a long time. Um, and the, uh, in BOSS, we're able to measure, uh, we have a thousand fibers in the spectrograph, so we can measure uh, a thousand uh, galaxy redshifts at a time. And on the best nights, uh, we have nine of those cartridges, uh, and we can get as many as, as 9,000 galaxy redshifts in a night. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're a theorist who works with, uh, with galaxy clustering data, like me, then you know, mostly you start at the point where these things have become catalogs uh, with lots of positions and redshifts and maybe colors and magnitudes, um, which, is, uh, which is very convenient. Uh, but for, uh, it's often important to remember uh, that all of these things actually start with, uh, first of all, with people building telescopes and cameras and spectrographs, uh, and then with people going out uh, every night under variable conditions and clouds and, uh, 
uh, and other complications and, uh, and collecting the data that end up producing this. So uh, one other uh, just brief uh, advertisement, one of, the, uh, one of the things that I've done over the last 10 years uh, that's been pretty fun is uh, collaborating with a, a sculptor named Josiah McElhaney uh, who does a wide variety of things, but the things I've been involved with are, are cosmologically inspired uh, sculptures. We've worked on uh, five different projects um, this, this is an, an image of one of them uh, that has uh, the Kobe map of the cosmic microwave background represented on that central sphere. And uh, we've done things about the expansion of the universe and multi multiverse inflation and so forth. Um, the, uh, there wasn't really, uh, I, I had too much to cover in four and a half hours anyway. Uh, but for any of you who would like to see more pictures of this and hear more about it, um, I will... Uh, I will show up here around 2, so the last half hour of the lunch break, and I've got various uh, pictures from these projects. Uh, so if you're interested enough to give up the last half hour of your lunch break, then show up at 2, uh, and I'll show you some things in this project that I'm happy to tell you about it. Um, but it's, uh, it's fun, but it's uh, somewhat off topic. So uh, that's for, for 2 o'clock today. Okay, so let me pick up with uh, modeling galaxy clustering. Uh, and I talked about four different approaches yesterday uh, relative, in fairly rapid succession. Uh, so hydro simulations, where we try to actually put the physics into our simulations to track where the galaxies uh, will form. Um, Semi-analytic population of halos and subhalos. Uh, from n body. So taking the history of each halo or each subhalo in the n body simulation, tracing it back, pasting a semi analytic galaxy formation model uh, on top of that to predict the galaxy properties. Uh, abundance matching. Which is basically doing the same thing populating the halos and subhalos from an n-body simulation, but instead of putting in a full uh, model for the gas cooling and star formation and feedback, uh, the assumption in abundance matching uh, is simply that more massive uh, halos or subhalos contain more luminous galaxies. Uh, you can extend this. Uh, to age matching, where you say that uh, at a given luminosity, the halos that formed earlier have the redder galaxies. Um, so it's, it's sort of replacing the theoretical model of galaxy formation in semi-analytic with just uh, enforcing a match to the observed galaxy luminosity function uh, or the observed, uh, the observed color distribution, and it's called abundance matching because you know, the way you decide to uh, what luminosity to assign to a given halo is you match the abundance of galaxies above some luminosity threshold to the abundance of halos, uh, the space density of halos, uh, above uh, the uh, corresponding mass threshold. So that uh, this matching of the space densities of galaxies and halos gives you the rule uh, by which you're able to uh, to assign things. And then uh, halo occupation distribution modeling, uh, which is uh, populating the halos of n body simulations, or sometimes using uh, analytic approximations uh, to calculate galaxy clustering in halos 
uh, in place of actually using a simulation. And, uh, but, it's, but HOD modeling generally doesn't make use of subhalos. So in terms of, of philosophy, uh, I would say that each of these two techniques is, uh, uses a, a complete, not necessarily uh, perfect, but it's, uh, it's imposing some complete theory uh, of galaxy formation. So by some means, numerical or semi-analytic, you're trying to calculate gas cooling, star formation, feedback, et cetera. Um, abundance matching is imposing uh, a prior about galaxy formation. Namely, that more massive halos host more luminous galaxies or, or higher stellar mass galaxies. One can uh, adjust that in some ways. You can introduce scatter or other things. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, this is saying instead of following all the physics, uh, we impose this particular assumption to populate the halos. Uh, and that's a fairly strong assumption. So I'll say this is imposing uh, some strong prior. Uh, and again, gives you a, a fully predicted uh, galaxy population. And so I, I think the, the difference in, in philosophy with HOD modeling um, is to try to have a, a flexible representation of galaxy formation. and fit to data. So uh, when you compare the results of, of, uh, of these to obs the observed galaxy correlation function, for instance, you test the combination of your cosmological model and your galaxy formation theory. Um, when you compare this to observations, you test uh, the combination of the cosmology and this assumption about how galaxy formation works. And empirically, it works surprisingly well. Uh, and also, this assumption you know, turns out to be a pretty good description of what comes out of either uh, of these approaches. And here, if you, uh, if you go in for a fixed cosmology, then what you get out of doing this fit is information about the relation between galaxies and dark matter halos. So you know, what mass halo hosts galaxies of, of different luminosities, of different colors, uh, and so forth. So that's something you can use as kind of empirical information about uh, galaxy formation physics, uh, or you can use it to test uh, the predictions of your uh, other galaxy formation theories. Um, and then from the point of view of cosmology, you say, well, I'll try different cosmological models. Uh, I'll allow myself to always give any cosmological model the best chance it can have to fit the observations. Uh, and if it can't fit them, then I go to a different cosmology. So uh, HOD model, uh, or HOD uh, is uh, a fully nonlinear description of galaxy bias uh, but in standard form so the way I and others have most often used it um, it assumes that P of nm, the probability of finding n galaxies uh, in a halo of mass m, is independent of the halo's uh, large scale environment.
because if I put galaxies preferentially in the halos uh, that are in denser regions or under dense regions, then that will change the clustering uh, for a fixed HOD, for a fixed P of NM. So, uh, so I would need to take into account that environmental dependence uh, in order to uh, actually be able to, to reproduce uh, everything about galaxy clustering. So the completeness of the HOD description uh, is tied to, uh, to this assumption, uh, or you can generalize it to build in some sort of, of environment dependence. And uh, so the initial motivation for this assumption came uh, partly out of um, uh, partly out of the uh, extended Presch-Schechter formalism for the uh, calculating the formation of halos, which at least in its simple form predicted that the assembly history of halos uh, depended on their mass but didn't depend on their larger scale environment. Um, and then there was also some, uh, some support for that from numerical simulations studying the formation history of halos, which showed that there was some correlation with the large scale environment, but that it was, uh, it was relatively mild. Um, I think this was Seth and Torman, is that right? Um, and the, um, uh, so that seemed to be, uh, you know, that at least was what we were appealing to in thinking that, that this was uh, a sensible approach to, to thinking about galaxy bias. Uh, however, as, you know, people do, did larger simulations, could get better statistics, uh, it became clear that there is uh, some level of uh, halo assembly bias and uh, in particular when we think of our halo mass function looking like this uh, and you know, here is that characteristic halo mass I was referring to as M star, that if we're looking at halos down here, halos that are well below uh, M star, so for low mass halos, um, halos that form earlier, are more strongly clustered. Uh, and they tend to avoid the lowest density regions. Uh, and this is particularly a fact that the very oldest halos uh, are preferentially in dense regions. Uh, once you get to the, the sort of garden variety uh, halos, uh, this effect is, is weaker, uh, and it's also weaker as you get uh, up around M star, uh, but there is some correlation between halo formation history uh, and halo environment. So then the question for galaxies becomes you know, how tightly correlated is the galaxy, are the galaxy properties with the formation history uh, of their parent halo? So if the galaxy properties are basically stochastically related to the formation history, then even if the halos have assembly bias, the galaxies won't. Um, but if the older halos also form the redder galaxies, then you'll expect to, uh, the galaxies can sort of inherit uh, assembly bias from their parent halos. And in that case, it's something that you would need to include uh, in an HOD description if you were going to capture that effect. So these two uh, slides here are showing uh, results on the left from uh, hydro simulation, uh, this is a paper that was submitted, um, not posted to AstroPH, uh, and then the first author has, uh, has moved into industry, so it remains to be seen whether we'll uh, ever get this out into the world, um, but it was in Kushal Mehta's uh, PhD thesis. So here we took results from hydro simulations, uh, SPH simulations, and identified galaxy populations above uh, different thresholds. Uh, so there are two different mass thresholds here shown by the, uh, the heavy and the light lines. Uh, and then divided the halos into the ones that were in uh, the, the most overdense environments, uh, the most underdense environments, and all the ones in the middle. Uh, so there's, uh, there's curves there for the top 20%, the bottom 20% of halos ranked by their environment on scales of a few megaparsecs. 
Uh, and what you can see for each mass threshold is kind of within the noise of the simulations, these things lie on top of each other. So in this simulation, there, even though uh, there may be a halo assembly bias, it's not affecting the galaxies. Uh, the HOD uh, pre is predicted to be independent of the large scale environment. Uh, however, uh, in semi analytic models, uh, you predict some degree of assembly bias for the galaxies. Uh, and there have been papers on this. Uh, and there's been very nice work recently by Andrew Heeren, Doug Watson, and their collaborators uh, take, uh, using uh, abundance matching and age matching to assign uh, galaxy colors. Uh, and they find that there is a galaxy assembly bias in the resulting catalogs. Uh, and in particular, when they assign luminosities to galaxies, uh, they use the circular velocity of the halo rather than its mass. And halos that form earlier tend to be more concentrated because uh, the central regions of the halo formed at earlier times when the density of the universe was higher. So at a given mass, it's the older halos that have a higher circular velocity. So if you're using that as your way of deciding on galaxy luminosity, then you tend to uh, uh, build in, uh, the galaxies tend to inherit uh, some of this information about the formation history of their halos. Uh, and so, uh, so they've had uh, various papers about that. This is putting this in the same form, uh, showing the, uh, the average occupation for galaxies above some luminosity threshold. Um, and uh, it's the same construction as over here. Uh, there's all the halos in the middle 60%. Uh, the, uh, the densest 20% and the least dense 20%. And these differences, you know, they're fairly subtle, okay? but that's enough. Uh, the fact that uh, a halo is more likely uh, to host a central galaxy if it's in an overdense region than an underdense region uh, is enough to have a noticeable impact on the clustering. So, uh, so this uh, galaxy assembly bias which uh, I like to think about as uh, environment dependence of the HOD uh, is a potentially important complication in HOD modeling. And particularly for this program of we want to marginalize over uh, all the HOD parameters to infer our cosmology, well, the question is, do we need to include uh, environmental parameters as part of that? So uh, this is one of the uh, frontiers of the field, figuring out how important this is, figuring out how to, to account for it. Um, I will uh, talk about one particular uh, application, which is uh, of, of interest in itself and also kind of an, an illustration of this approach, uh, which uh, has to do with galaxy galaxy lensing. So usually when we think of, of weak lensing, a weak lensing survey uh, like the CFHT lensing survey or what Euclid's going to do or what the dark energy survey is doing, uh, we typically think about cosmic shear. Okay? So you take uh, images of a large area of sky, uh, you measure the shapes uh, of, uh, of lots of distant galaxies, uh, and you're asking, uh, on average, are nearby, gal uh, nearby source galaxies are they aligned with each other because of some intervening stuff that's shearing all of them in the same direction uh, and therefore producing correlations of their ellipticities? So in cosmic shear, uh, you are just looking at the sources that are being lensed by intervening dark matter, uh, and you're trying to measure the degree to which galaxy shapes are correlated with each other uh, as 
some uh, at least statistical measure of the clustering of intervening dark matter. In galaxy-galaxy lensing, the idea is that, that you, you pick some sample of foreground objects uh, that uh, you think of as your lenses. <clears throat> and then uh, you look at the, uh, the background galaxies uh, around, uh, so things at higher redshift, uh, but in the neighborhood of that lens. And on average, those should be stretched perpendicular to the line of sight between that galaxy, uh, between the lens galaxy and, uh, sorry, between the source galaxy and this foreground lens. So this is the kind of thing we see in galaxy clusters where we see giant arcs um, uh, that are stretched tangential to, uh, to the line to the center of the cluster. And when we look at individual galaxies, you know, these stretches that are produced are only changes of half a percent or one percent uh, in the shape of the galaxies that have uh, strong ellipticity, so you can't measure this for any individual galaxy. But statistically averaging over, uh, uh, over many pairs of source galaxies and lens galaxies, you can detect uh, the statistical signal of the average tangential shear uh, stretching of galaxies tangent to the line uh, or, or perpendicular to the line of sight to the galaxy. And so, yes? Is this effect observable for any kind of galaxy as a lens? Yes. So, uh, you know, it's, a pat it's simply a matter of, uh, of how many, um, you know, whether you've got enough lenses uh, and source, whether, you, whether you've got enough pairs to predict it. Let me see if I've got. I don't have a, a great plot of that here, but the, so the, um, yeah, so you, you're, you know, you need your, you need a, po a survey that's deep enough that you've got a population of sources that's behind the things you're taking as a population of lenses. Um, but for instance, in the SDSS, most of what's been done is to take the galaxies in the spectroscopic survey as the lens population. So these are at redshifts of, say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. People are now doing it with BOSS, so out at redshift of 0.5 or 0.6. Uh, and then you take the galaxies in the imaging survey. Uh, you might use photometric redshifts uh, to try to divide them into shells. Um, but on average, the galaxies in the imaging survey uh, are more distant. And you look for the average distortion of the galaxies in the, uh, in the background uh, relative to the foreground. And this is something that, uh, so the first, uh, the first detections of this signal were uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, but this was one of the, the big early results from the Sloan survey, because once you had a couple of hundred square degrees uh, of good imaging, then you could actually measure this signal out to many megaparsecs. Um, and in particular, what this gives you, uh, so uh, analysis, uh, of GGL, galaxy galaxy lensing, uh, measures the product of omega m times psi gm. Okay, so psi gm is the galaxy matter cross correlation. And the, uh, so if you think, you know, right around, if we're, if we're looking at, at uh, you know, 100 kiloparsecs uh, around the galaxy, you can basically think of this as measuring the halo mass profile, right? So as the dark matter drops off, this lensing signal gets weaker, uh, and you can map uh, the halo mass profiles of, uh, the average halo mass profiles of your sample of lenses. But more generally, even if you're 20 megaparsecs away, if you're sitting on a galaxy, the matter will be overdense. Uh, at 20 megaparsecs around galaxies compared to random places. Uh, and so that still shows up uh, as a signal. Um, and there are, uh, at this point, the measurements of this do uh, extend to, uh, to tens of megaparsecs. And the, uh, so you're measuring psi gm because uh, you're trying to pick up what's the, you're, you're sensitive to the excess matter density correlated with galaxies. 
but it's proportional to omega matter because, uh, again, if, there's, if the universe were empty, then, uh, or if the universe were nearly empty, then there wouldn't be enough mass to produce any lensing. Uh, so the, the more matter there is in the universe, uh, the stronger the lensing signal is for a given correlation. So there are some complications in how you go from uh, what you actually measure to this, because you've got projections and, uh, and so forth. But this is, uh, this is really the physical quantity uh, that you can extract from galaxy-galaxy lensing measurements. And this is uh, interesting because we can also measure uh, psi gg, the correlation function of the galaxies uh, with each other. And uh, so you know, this in itself allows you to say things about, say, the, the halo profiles of different classes of galaxies. Uh, there's a, a wonderful paper by uh, Rachel Mandelbaum and collaborators in 2006 uh, looking at uh, how the halo masses and halo profiles of, uh, of galaxies in the Sloan survey depend on the luminosity of the galaxies, the color of the galaxies, the, the large-scale environment. Um, but uh, from the point of view of, of cosmology, uh, what's interesting is combining galaxy-galaxy lensing uh, and galaxy clustering. Because in, uh, in linear theory, uh, plus linear bias, so by linear bias I mean that the density contrast of galaxies is just some bias factor, Bg, times the density contrast of matter. We expect uh, that the galaxy correlation function is just uh, bg squared times the correlation function of the matter, psi m m. And psi g m, uh, this galaxy matter cross correlation, uh, is going to just be one bias factor times psi m m because I'm doing psi gm is the expectation value of delta g delta m. So I just pick up one of these bgs. Um, and you know, my weak lensing observable is really that multiplied by omega m. So let's write this. And at large scales, this is what we expect uh, to hold. Uh, linear bias should be uh, a good approximation on sufficiently large scales. So this we can measure just from the galaxies. This we can measure from galaxy-galaxy lensing. And so if we divide um, omega m psi gm, which is one observable, by the square root of uh, psi gg, then we can get this galaxy bias factor, right? This is where all the complicated physics of galaxy formation is going in. It's just determining this one number, but we can make it cancel out. Um, and this should be equal to uh, omega matter uh, times uh, psi mm to the 1 half. And we can do this as a, I've, I've dropped my r's here, but you can do this as a function of radius. But if you, and uh, the, amplitude of the matter correlation function uh, scales with, with sigma 8. So this is going to be proportional to omega matter times uh, this overall amplitude of mass fluctuations. So this is one route to trying to uh, constrain the, um, uh, the amplitude of mass fluctuations using uh, the same weak lens, uh, the same kind of survey that you might uh, use for cosmic shear. Uh, which will also go after something like the same combination of parameters. Uh, but the, you're using different information, um, and there are some, a, a number of ways in which galaxy-galaxy lensing is a little bit easier to measure uh, than cosmic shear. Uh, and there's a similar amount of information. Right? You're using the same measurements of the galaxy shapes, um, and, 
And so in principle, you should be able to get uh, answers from this that are comparably good, uh, comparably precise to the answers you get from a cosmic shear analysis of the same survey. So people have done this. Um, and uh, there have been a few papers uh, that have uh, carried out versions of this program on large scales. And, the, um, and so, uh, but they've taken a fair amount of care to isolate the observations to use of only information beyond five megaparsecs or so. Uh, and the, um, because they're worried about these approximations breaking down, on smaller scales. And so that's some limiting factor in the, the precision of, of the measurements. But in that uh, figure I showed you on the first day, uh, with all the red points not lining up with the black points, uh, one of, I think, the most, uh, one of the more convincing of those red points that's giving a lower amplitude of fluctuations uh, is actually from uh, uh, Mandelbaum et al. 2013, where they're using the galaxy galaxy lensing plus galaxy clustering uh, measured for SDSS galaxies. So HOD analysis is one potential way of pushing this down to smaller scales, right? because really what we need is, uh, is to be able to uh, describe these two functions into the nonlinear regime. Um, and now we can't uh, rely on having a single BG, uh, but we might have uh, all of our HOD parameters uh, to worry about. Yes? So I would, I mean, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't even attempt to disentangle them. I think that really they, you know, they are in some sense the same thing. When you're measuring cosmic shear, you are measuring the fluctuations that are being produced by the dark matter distribution that those galaxies are also tracing. Um, but if you ask about the, uh, the actual observation, you know, in the one case, you're taking uh, your, your background source galaxies and you're asking, are their orientations correlated with each other? In the galaxy-galaxy lensing case, you're asking, are these background galaxies tangentially stretched relative to the foreground galaxies. Um, and uh, so if you do these measurements from the same survey, there should be some covariance of the, of the measurement errors because you're measuring the same structure. But it's actually pretty weak, basically, because weak lensing measurements are always extremely noisy because you know, for any one of those individual background galaxies, uh, your signal to noise of the measurement is much, much lower than one. Uh, so one should think about whether, uh, about the level of correlation of the answers you get from these two different analyses uh, of the same survey region. Uh, but actually, I, th I think it's fairly weak simply because weak lensing measurements are noisy. Good question. Um, so uh, here's uh, one way of, uh, of Looking at this, this is just a theory paper, but showing uh, if you consider a succession of models with stronger matter clustering, going from uh, matter clustering sigma 8 of 0.6 up to 1, uh, and you change the HOD in this way, as you go to higher sigma 8, there are more massive clusters. Uh, so you have to uh, start putting fewer galaxies at a given halo mass, or else you end up with too many galaxies and too much clustering. But if you do that, you can get the galaxy-galaxy correlation to be almost the same. Uh, so these, uh, the galaxy clustering matches up when you make these changes to the HOD in these different cosmological models. But the predicted uh, galaxy matter correlation, or this is the direct thing to measure with weak lensing, uh, as you go to a, more, a stronger matter clustering, the predicted signal uh, goes steadily up because the galaxies are residing in more massive halos, uh, and you pick that up with the weak lensing measurements. So that's the principle. You use uh, HOD to fit the galaxy clustering. You predict the galaxy matter correlation, uh, and that becomes a test uh, of the cosmological model. Um, and one of the questions is, is how much does uh, the possibility of assembly bias screw this up? 
because you um, uh, because maybe this model is is insufficiently complete. Uh, and one of my uh, one of my students is is looking at uh, at this problem, uh, and we've got uh, you know the, an encouraging result so far is what you really care about from the point of view of this technique uh, is what's usually called the cross correlation coefficient uh, RGM, uh, which is psi gm divided by the square root of psi gg psi mm. So this is telling you how well the galaxy and matter fields are, are correlated with each other. This is something that is expected to go to 1 at large scales. So really, I should actually have it in this equation, RGM. And uh, uh, because if the galaxy and matter fields were uncorrelated with each other, then I wouldn't get psi GM even if there was matter clustering. But I left it out because the expectation is that this will go to 1 on smaller scales. So really what we need out of our galaxy clustering theory for this particular approach is to be able to predict RGM. And it turns out, so we've, what we've done is taken those abundance matching catalogs, which have some assembly bias, as, uh, as we saw earlier, um, and said, suppose we fit that blindly with an HOD, ignoring this, and then we calculate this thing, okay, which uh, at large scales, so you know, if this is 1 megaparsec, 10 megaparsecs, um, and uh, you know, this is uh, RGM, this is going to be 1, and then it sort of does some, some stuff like that. It might dip below and come up above uh, by 10 or 20 percent. Uh, but it turns out that at least down to scales of a megaparsec, uh, what you end up predicting for this thing, which is what you really care about uh, for the purposes of this analysis, you get the right answer from that if you've chosen an HOD model to fit the observed galaxy clustering. Because basically, assembly bias is having some impact, but it's having an impact on this and an impact on this that are proportional to each other, and they cancel out uh, sort of in the same way that the bias factor cancels out in linear theory. So this is an example of where the field is now um, that uh, we're trying to, uh, we're worrying about effects that are beyond those in, the, uh, in some of the, the earlier models. Uh, but which may be important if we're trying to do precision cosmology. Uh, and in some cases, those will compromise the results, and in other places, they won't. Uh, and you just have to investigate each one uh, and figure out uh, whether you can, uh, what you need to do in order to extract uh, cosmological information out of generally not galaxy clustering on its own, but galaxy clustering in combination with something like galaxy-galaxy lensing, redshift space distortions, uh, masses of clusters, and so forth. Um, and uh, so this is a recent paper by, uh, well, recent like last week, uh, by uh, Ying Zhu and Rachel Mandelbaum, where they've uh, taken measurements of galaxy, uh, projected galaxy correlation functions and galaxy matter correlation functions measured from weak lensing for different uh, samples of galaxy mass in, uh, in the SDSS. So top panel is the galaxy clustering, bottom panel is the, uh, the surface, uh, the galaxy-galaxy uh, lensing measurements. And they're fitting them with HOD models or souped up HOD models uh, that, uh, that Ying has, uh, uh, has, Ying Zhu has figured out how to make very good use of, of these samples. Uh, and the focus here of this paper is about what you learn about galaxy formation and, uh, and halos and so forth. Uh, but one thing that I think is interesting is you know, they get this very good fit, joint fit to the data for uh, omega matter of 0.26 and sigma eight of 0.77, uh, which uh, is significantly lower than the, uh, the Planck values of 0.31 and uh, 0.82 or something. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is not independent from that previous uh, red point I showed you, but, uh, but the fact that you know, our, our modeling so far suggests that things should remain robust into at least the kind of megaparsec scale, uh, I think it's an interesting direction uh, for them to go next to ask, how far can you push the cosmology before uh, uh, 
before you can, and in particular the amplitude of matter fluctuations, before you can no longer uh, jointly fit these data. Okay, I'm going to uh, now switch uh, over towards uh, a little bit about surveys in general, but mostly uh, about uh, baryon acoustic oscillations, but any questions on what I've said so far? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, I think that, that uh, you know, right now we have two sigma discrepancies from, you know, several but not all measurements of these quantities, right? where that means, you know, clusters, cosmic shear, galaxy, galaxy lensing, Regis space distortions and more kind of one sigma. Right? So I would believe there's a problem when we've got uh, three sigma discrepancies from three different analyses, preferably using three completely different techniques. Um, and I think this is something where on, on the weak lensing side, I mean, I guess that, uh, that in some sense gets us uh, to hear that, that we're uh, when we think about the imaging surveys being used for weak lensing, uh, currently the, the best weak lensing results are from uh, the uh, CFHT lens survey, uh, which covered about 150 square degrees. So that's 0.5% uh, of the sky. Okay. If you don't know it, a number you should know is that there are 40,000 square degrees in the sky. Um, and the, uh, so if someone surveyed 10,000 square degrees, they've surveyed a quarter of the sky. Um, and uh, so the dark energy survey, uh, which is ongoing now, is going to go to basically the same kind of depth and image quality as CFHT lens, uh, but it's a survey area that's 30 times larger. It's about 5,000 square degrees. Um, so that, uh, you know, with, with a, a 30 fold improvement in the data volume, Either these things will become quite convincing, um, or uh, the measurements will move closer together. Um, and then in a somewhat longer term, uh, we'll get much larger galaxy redshift surveys, uh, and those will enable redshift space distortion measurements that have small enough errors that you can see whether, whether they give the same discrepancy. So, um, so I think that, that in uh, if, if the current, uh, I should say, I think it is most likely that, you know, the current discrepancies will go away just because, you know, most interesting results go away. Um, but not all of them do, right? The supernovae did not go away. Um, and the, uh, and so uh, I do think that on a time scale of, uh, of three years, uh, if the current central values of these measurements are correct, then we'll have much more convincing measurements of them by then. Um, so our kind of current state of play uh, is uh, a lot of the, the cosmological data sets come from, uh, from the Sloan survey, which has done imaging over about a quarter of the sky. Okay, if you've heard Stripe 82 and not known what it means, uh, Stripe 82, uh, the Sloan survey was, was uh, divided into to stripes that were uh, scanned across the sky. Uh, and there was one particular stripe in the South Galactic Cap that was scanned over and over and over again um, to look for time variable phenomena, to look for supernovae, uh, but also to make a, a deeper imaging. Uh, so that's about uh, a couple of hundred square degrees. Um, so it's part of the Sloan survey, but one that was uh, deeper uh, but smaller area. Um, and this is where most of the, uh, a lot of things have, have come from, and now PanStars uh, has uh, completed observations over about three quarters of the sky, uh, and there's uh, analyses of those going on, um, but not yet uh, weak lensing measurements from there. And uh, spectroscopic, uh, SDSS originally did a sample of about a million uh, galaxies of all types, 
uh, and 100,000 galaxies that were selected to be uh, luminous objects probing a large volume. Um, and, uh, and then in SDSS3, uh, we wanted to focus specifically on baryon acoustic oscillations and probe a very large volume. So there we went after luminous galaxies uh, and observed about one and a half million of those uh, extending to higher redshifts uh, out to about uh, 0.7 and also measured the specter of 160,000 uh, distant quasars to measure the Lyman alpha forest uh, absorption in those quasars. So uh, I'm going to say some general things about BAO analysis, first focusing particularly on galaxies. Uh, and then I'll give you uh, at least a lightning version of, uh, of the Lyman alpha forest uh, and how you use that for cosmology. Um, and then I'll stop. OK, so uh, this is one view of the Sloan imaging survey. Uh, so, uh, so about 8,000 square degrees in the northern galactic cap, uh, 2,500 square degrees in the southern galactic cap. Uh, so this map is color coded by the, uh, by the density of galaxies in different pixels. Uh, and you can see just uh, there's some zoom ins uh, that show you kind of the level of, uh, of detail you get down to. So that's you know, a star forming region in, uh, in a galaxy uh, in there. And um, so when we wrote a press release on, on uh, this uh, data set, uh, Bob Nickel came up with the, uh, the memorable uh, analogy that you could display this map at full resolution using half a million high definition televisions. Okay. So there's, uh, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of detail in these imaging maps. And then it's from that imaging that we selected galaxies, uh, put fibers, you know, drilled holes into, uh, into plates and plugged those holes with fibers and measured spectra and measured redshifts. So you know, this is a pretty picture of uh, large scale structure in a slice uh, where each point represents a galaxy and the color uh, represents the, the color of the galaxy. So the red points are made of older stars. Uh, and you can see large scale filaments and voids. You can see that uh, older galaxies like to live in denser regions uh, and so forth. Um, but actually, a lot of the cosmological information, uh, and particularly the BAO measurements from, uh, from the original Sloan survey, came not from that densely sampled galaxy distribution, which you see here which in this picture is shown as, as the white points, but from this luminous red galaxy sample, so things that were selected based on color to be objects uh, that were at higher redshifts, uh, and, uh, and so they had to be luminous in order to, uh, to, have the, uh, to have their observed apparent brightness. And these objects are relatively easy to get redshifts of, uh, and so uh, the luminous red galaxy sample did a much sparser map. You can see, you know, this, this doesn't look nearly as pretty, uh, but, uh, but it does trace structure over a much larger volume. So sometimes, for some purposes, you're interested in detail uh, with which you map uh, a given volume, and for other purposes, uh, you're interested in covering large volume, and you don't need all of that detail. Um, and this was the galaxy distribution uh, from BOSS. So uh, yellow and red are the same sets of points you saw before, but now white is from uh, the BOSS survey from SDSS3. Uh, and so here, you know, we're using the same kind of technique, but pushing further out in redshift uh, and going, uh, going somewhat higher in density. So we've got a denser sampling of structure, but also a much larger volume uh, because we're going uh, out further. So the basic idea with uh, BAO is that there are pressure waves uh, that propagate in the pre-recombination universe when the photons uh, are tied to the electrons uh, and the electrons are tied to the baryons. And you can think of this as uh, analogous to dropping a rock in a pond, and it sends out a ripple uh, that propagates. But at recombination, uh, the photons decouple 
from the baryons because uh, all the, uh, the free electron opacity goes away, and those waves stall, uh, so you end up with something that's made at some particular distance. Okay? So this is a more quantitative version uh, of, uh, of this little thing over here, showing uh, the evolution of a perturbation uh, where you start with an overdensity in the dark matter um, and, uh, and let it uh, evolve forward. So the red and the blue curves, which are basically superposed here, are showing the gas and the photons. So the photons and the gas are locked together uh, until we get to uh, the redshift of recombination, which occurs between here and here. And then what happens is the photons continue to stream out, stream away from this initial perturbation. The dark matter is still overdense near the middle, uh, but we've built up this peak in the baryon distribution. Now, the baryons are only uh, a small fraction of the total matter. So once there's no longer pressure driving them, you know, they're feeling the gravity of the dark matter, but the dark matter is feeling the gravity of the baryons. So uh, as things continue, uh, this baryon peak gets weaker because the baryons are falling towards the dark matter, but we start to develop a bump in the, uh, the dark matter profile. Uh, and uh, finally, at, at late times, this is now by redshift of 10, uh, the baryons and the dark matter both have this, this excess uh, of ma material uh, away from this central peak. So this is what happens for one individual if you had just, just one spike in the initial uh, density distribution. Uh, so really you have Gaussian fluctuations and you have this process, you, know, you have these kind of ripples going out from all the, the overdense regions uh, in there. But the consequence is that you predict a bump in the correlation function um, or, uh, or oscillations in the power spectrum. So let's just summarize that. Pressure waves uh, in the pre recombination universe imprint a characteristic scale on uh, matter clustering. at this scale that I introduced in the, um, in the first lecture when I was talking about the, uh, the cosmic microwave background, okay. the sound horizon scale, and this depends on when recombination occurs. It depends on the evolution of the sound speed. But those basically just depend on the matter uh, and baryon densities uh, and the radiation density of the universe. So those are things we can now uh, infer from modeling CMB fluctuations very well. Uh, and this is uh, 147.49 uh, megaparsecs co-moving. Um, and the uncertainty due to the uncertainty in the cosmological parameters uh, is about 0.4 percent. Actually, it was 0.4 percent when Planck 2013, so it must be smaller now, but I haven't actually figured out how much small. I, I didn't look up how much small. Okay. So we know uh, what this scale is. That is making some assumptions about pre-recombination physics. In particular, it's assuming, for instance, that dark energy was unimportant uh, at that time, which we expect, because uh, certainly for a cosmological constant, uh, dark energy is negligible at high redshift. Uh, it's making the assumption that we got the standard number of neutrino species. There's not uh, some extra degrees of freedom uh, that are altering the age of the universe or altering the sound speed. So uh, this is not absolutely model independent, uh, but it depends only on uh, things that would affect the pre-recombination universe. Um, and then uh, that gives us a, a ruler of known scale. 
And so if we pick that up in, in transverse galaxy clustering, oh, I should, so then say this shows up as, uh, appears as a bump in the correlation function or oscillations in the power spectrum. So if I do uh, psi of r, actually linear uh, rather than logarithmic, um, then you know this is sort of uh, dropping way down, and then I get this little bump uh, out here where this scale is RS, this 150 megaparsecs. And one caution in, in looking at papers, often this axis is marked, uh, so this axis might be marked in megaparsecs, uh, or it might be marked in H to the minus 1 megaparsecs. Okay. So if it's in H to the minus 1 megaparsecs, then this bump will be at about 100, because okay, H is about 0.7. Um, but we actually, you know, the CMB determines this uh, not in H inverse megaparsecs, but you know, in centimeters. Uh, or, or megaparsecs. The, um, uh, so often in papers we, we want to show the BAO bump more uh, better, so we'll plot R squared psi of R, uh, and uh, so that's shown up here, right? That's, uh, that's R squared psi of R, uh, and then this bump looks more prominent. But you should remember it looks more prominent because we've uh, multiplied this by uh, you know much bigger factor than these things here, and the correlate the Fourier transform of a delta function is a sine wave. This is not quite a delta function, but it's a narrow peak. So if you do uh, p of k versus k, then uh, what happens is instead of uh, a smooth power spectrum like this, uh, you get a power spectrum with oscillations that are basically the, the Fourier transform uh, of this, and because this has some finite width, those oscillations are damped. Okay? So that's how this appears in either the power spectrum uh, or the correlation function. Uh, and so if we can measure that in transverse clustering, then we can infer uh, the angular diameter distance uh, from taking that length, dividing it by the angle. And if we can uh, measure it in the line of sight direction as a velocity separation, we can divide a length by a velocity uh, and get the Hubble parameter at that time. So, uh, so relative to uh, supernovae as a distance indicator, uh, there are several interesting properties of, uh, of BAO. Um, so. Uh, BAO uh, distances are measured in absolute units, right, in megaparsecs or centimeters, uh, rather than uh, just giving you relative distances as a function of redshift. Um, you can, uh, can separately measure da, the angular diameter distance, and h of z. And here I'm, uh, I'm particularly contrasting uh, BAO with, uh, with supernovae. The achievable precision increases with redshift. Because at higher redshift, there's more co-moving volume. So you can measure correlation functions more precisely. Uh, and you can determine these distances more precisely. Um, whereas supernovae, on a, a, overall, it gets harder the further away you go. Now, BAO, you have to do more work to map that more distant universe. So this, this achievable precision uh, doesn't come for free. Uh, but, uh, but it's a method that gets more and more powerful uh, in its precision, the, the higher redshift at which you apply it. Um, the CMB uh, measures uh, 
the same uh, scale uh, at z equals 1100. So particularly that, that angular scale in the CMB is using the same, uh, same standard ruler. Um, and what I think is the, uh, the most, you know, has made BAO seem uh, particularly valuable uh, is that uh, even the most powerful BAO surveys seem, uh, are likely to be limited by statistics rather than systematics. Now that's partly because, you know, even if you map the whole universe, uh, the statistics still only get you to, uh, you know, maybe uh, tenth of a percent or 0.05 uh, percent. Um, whereas, in principle, with supernovae, if you had 100,000 supernovae, which are not that hard to observe, you could divide by square root of a very, very big number and get extremely small fractional errors, uh, and you'd be dominated by systematics. But um, but, and I'll justify this statement a little bit more, um, it does seem like uh, BAO in principle can get to very high precision uh, and still uh, not, be uh, not be limited by systematic uncertainties in the measurements. Um, so these are all virtues compared to supernovae, but really they have complementary information. Uh, supernovae can give you very high precision at low redshifts, um, and they, uh, and this, uh, this difference between sort of absolute and relative measurements uh, is quite interesting in, in various ways. Uh, so this is not an argument that you should do BAO uh, instead of supernovae, uh, but that the two of them together are actually quite a bit more powerful uh, than either one on its own. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit more about the statistics and the, er uh, the, the, uh, the sources of error uh, in BAO measurements, but any Questions on what I've said so far? Yeah. So in the Planck papers, if you say, you know, if, if, if they just say, you know, Planck TT or TT plus EE or something, then that's using only the CMB data. If they say, uh, you know, TT plus EE plus BAO, then the BAO measurements they're referring to are the ones from, are the galaxy ones from BOSS, from SDSS. Question. Yeah. Yes, and you know, in some sense, that's what we're doing in a BAO analysis. Is uh, is you know, you, anal you can analyze the whole shape of the galaxy power spectrum, and you can analyze the, the wiggles themselves. Relative to the CMB, you know, the wiggles in the galaxy power spectrum are much weaker, and they're much weaker because in the CMB you're directly seeing the photons, right? And so, uh, so, so those baryon fluctuations were big at recombination, but they're small today because baryons are a subdominant contribution. Okay, so in the CMB, you know, the, the power spectrum is doing this. Uh, in the galaxies, it's sort of doing this. So there's less uh, statistical power there. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, it's quite analogous uh, using the galaxy power spectrum to get at uh, uh, things from the BAO, but also to get at the tilt of the primordial spectrum and the radiation and matter densities and so forth. Um, and in general, you get more, better constraints out of using uh, the CMB together with galaxy clustering than out of using uh, either one on its own because there, you know, there are degeneracies that affect one measurement but that are broken by considering something that's 3D or something that's at a different redshift. Yeah? So these type of genetic observations are underlying Let me come back to that. So, The, um, so 
So I'm going to talk about sampling variants uh, versus uh, shot noise. And I'll do it in the specific context of BAO measurements. But many of these uh, considerations also apply to, uh, to other kinds of measurements, redshift-based distortions, uh, or with some, uh, with some changes of, uh, of terminology to, uh, to weak lensing. So if, you, uh, if we mapped the entire co-moving volume in some redshift range, uh, Z1 to Z2, then uh, the BAO measurement would be limited by uh, cosmic variance. And uh, so that's you know, just the limit from the fact that we have only so many, so much volume, only so many structures in that volume. So there's only so much precision with which we can measure uh, that clustering. And so this, uh, uh, this notion is familiar from the cosmic microwave background. You know, we measure all of the modes on large scales. Uh, and there's just only so many to measure. So we can only measure the CMB power spectrum uh, so precisely. And the same is true for galaxies, even though now we're measuring uh, in 3D. Uh, those cosmic variance errors for, uh, for BAO are quite small. Uh, they're plotted here. Um, and uh, most of the figures here are from this uh, review article. So if you want to look them up, you can find them there. Um, so for instance, uh, so for uh, at z of about 1, uh, the error on uh, the cosmic variance error uh, is about 0.2% uh, on DA uh, and 0.35% on H of Z. And if we, uh, if we map instead of the whole sky, uh, if you map a fraction F sky, so if you map 10,000 square degrees and F sky is, sky is a quarter, then the sampling variance error uh, is the cosmic variance times uh, F sky to the minus a half. Okay? So just as you'd expect, uh, errors drop like the square root of the volume. So if you measure you know, only uh, one quarter uh, of the entire volume of, uh, of the universe, then that means your errors will be twice as big. So uh, when I talk about achievable precision, uh, I'm basically referring to mapping. You know, We're never going to map the whole sky, because the galaxy is in the way. Uh, but we might be able to map half the sky. Uh, and sample it well enough to, to completely sample the structure in some redshift range. Uh, and BOSS has basically uh, done that for a quarter of the sky uh, out to about a redshift of a half, uh, out to a redshift of about 0.6. Uh, and you know, these numbers depend on how thick a redshift shell you're, you're taking. So this was for a redshift shell that's you know, about 30% uh, of its range. So that is. Uh, the limiting factor due to finite volume. But uh, you have to actually map that volume accurately enough to measure the clustering within it. So the other uh, contribution, yeah. Spectroscopic. Yes, so this is assuming that you've uh, this is basically assuming that you're resolving uh, structure well enough that you're actually able to resolve the width of that BAO peak. Um, and the, uh, so from, 
So if you map a volume V, then the number of Fourier modes in that volume uh, is uh, 4 pi k squared dk. That's my number of Fourier modes per, or density of Fourier modes per interval dk uh, times the volume. Uh, and then there's some factor that comes in from your Fourier conventions. Um, but the number of Fourier modes is just proportional to the volume. Um, and the, uh, if you uh, map with uh, tracers of uh, number density n, then uh, the error on the power spectrum is the, the fractional error with which you measure it uh, is going to be nk to the minus a half, right? It drops like the square root of the number of Fourier modes you've measured times 1 plus 1 over np. So the power spectrum uh, has units of volume. Uh, and so if you multiply it by a number density, you get a dimensionless number. Uh, and this is the shot noise contribution. So it just comes from the fact that you know, whatever structure is there, if I don't have many things with which to trace it, uh, I will make errors uh, just in actually mapping out the, uh, the structure that I've got. And uh, so in general, uh, if I want to get small errors on the power spectrum, then I want to map a large volume, because this is proportional to v to the minus a half times 1 plus 1 over np. But I also want a high enough density of tracers that this uh, uh, that I'm not paying a big penalty from not mapping the structure well enough. And uh, for, uh, for BAO, the relevant scale uh, is roughly um, K of about 0.2 uh, H. Uh, inverse h megaparsecs. Um, and the, uh, you know, so really you have to think about the overall impact on the, uh, on the, the feature you're trying to measure. Uh, but roughly speaking, you can determine the importance of, of, uh, of the shot noise from thinking about the power at about this scale. Uh, and the, um, Let's see, for, uh, so for NP, much bigger than 1, this term is negligible, uh, and you're limited by sample variance. And for NP uh, less than 1, then you're limited uh, by shot noise. And so now we come to this question of, well, what kinds of galaxies do you, do, uh, do you use to, to measure this? Uh, and so a, a rough uh, a rule of thumb uh, is that the uh, number density required for uh, NP equal to 1 is about 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, that's in h cubed per cubic megaparsec uh, times 1 over sigma 8 for those galaxies squared. Okay. Because the p that matters here 
is the p of the galaxies. Right? So if the galaxy, if there's stronger structure in the galaxy distribution, then uh, you can measure it more easily. Uh, and so more strongly uh, biased galaxies have, uh, we have sigma 8 galaxy uh, is BG times sigma 8 matter. So if you have more strongly biased galaxies, uh, then the power spectrum is higher by BG squared, uh, and so you need a lower number density. So in general, you would like to uh, observe a uh, highly biased sample, if you can, uh, because then you don't need to observe as many of them uh, in order to be avoid being limited by shot noise. Uh, so in the case of uh, a BOSS, uh, this space density of BOSS galaxies is a little below this, it's about 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Uh, but the galaxies have a bias of about 2. Um, they're luminous objects uh, that are strongly clustered. Uh, and so uh, the result is that, that for BOSS, uh, this NP is, is about 2. Um, and so shot noise is not completely negligible, but it's small. Um, and that's how, uh, that's how things were designed. And if we, uh, you know, if we had, uh, if we had more observing time, we would spend it going to a larger area because it's more important to increase the volume, rather than observing fainter galaxies uh, and increasing n. On the other hand, if we'd been in the limit of, if, you know, if we'd had n p of a half, and we had more observing time, then we would probably be better off just. Uh, mapping the same volume, but taping deeper exposures in order to increase n. So this is always one of the basic uh, trades in any cosmological survey is uh, depth versus area. Is it better to increase your area, or is it better to, uh, to observe deeper? Uh, in the case of weak lensing, you know, would you rather uh, image a larger area and get more galaxy shapes that way, uh, or would you rather image deeper and see a, a higher surface density uh, of, uh, of lensing galaxies. Uh, and it's a quantitative question, and it depend you have to think about what you're trying to measure uh, and what's the most efficient way uh, of using your observational resources. And, the, um, uh, and so uh, in the case of uh, BAO surveys, you know, this is affected by how you're measuring the redshifts, how big your telescope is, how hard is it uh, to, get, uh, to get further out, uh, and so forth. Um, so there are several, uh, I, I want to finish by actually showing you some of the results from BOSS. So there, uh, there are several uh, topics that I'm going to, to not cover, uh, but there, uh, there are some things in the notes and there are leads from the notes uh, to, uh, to other things. So uh, look them up if you're interested. Um, but the, uh, one of those topics is, uh, is reconstruction. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that as galaxies move, uh, they sort of diffuse out of, uh, of those shells. Uh, and that lowers uh, this peak. Well, you can see it up there on the left. It starts out as a fairly sharp peak. And really, you know, the precision of your measurement is you're trying to ask how accurately can you determine the location of that peak. And roughly speaking, the, the nice thing about BAO is this peak is only about uh, 10 megaparsecs in width, and it's out at 150 megaparsecs. Um, and, the, uh, and so the result is that, uh, you know, the peak is only about 10%, the width is only about 10% of the scale. And the precision with which you can centroid a peak is basically the width of the peak divided by the signal to noise of the detection. So if you have a 10 sigma measurement, then you can centroid the peak to one tenth of its width. And so if you ask, you know, why, so a 10 sigma BAO measurement will give you about a 1% distance measurement because you've got a width whose uh, peak whose width is about 10%, and if you can decentroid it to a tenth of its width, then that's a 1% distance measurement. Um, so nonlinear evolution broadens this peak as galaxies diffuse out of that shell. Reconstruction is a way of trying to sharpen that peak up by moving galaxies back uh, to their original position. Uh, and on this question of, of systematic uncertainties, um, the, uh, this is showing uh, how the peak shifts for, for in n-body simulations for the matter distribution. So you actually get shifts of about 0.2% uh, for matter. 
Uh, this is showing for halos, uh, and here the, for, for highly biased halos, the shifts are something like uh, a half a percent. Okay, so if you completely ignored that, then you would get answers that were wrong by noticeable fractions of your, uh, of your desired error. Um, but you can calculate this and you can correct it, uh, and you know, then your, your, your uncertainty becomes your uncertainty in your correction. So if you've got a, a half a percent shift uh, and you know the correction uh, to 20%, then that means you've, you've got a 0.1% residual uh, uncertainty. And actually, one of the nice things about reconstruction is it seems to remove even these small shifts. So uh, the statement that BAO are likely to be uh, limited by, uh, by statistics rather than systematics uh, largely comes down to these kinds of experiments that trying to put in uh, ideas about nonlinear evolution and galaxy bias, uh, at least uh, with reconstruction, the shifts that occur uh, are still too small for us to measure with uh, simulations uh, that cover uh, hundreds of cu cubic gigaparsecs. So, you know, there's still more to be done to demonstrate that. Uh, you know, a survey like DAISY or, or, uh, or Euclid or, uh, or WFIRST will be uh, cosmic, will be limited by statistics, but, but the signs there look good. Um, so in BOSS, you know, here was the, the galaxy sample. Here is uh, the correlation function uh, is transverse separation and line of sight separation. Uh, and you see this uh, overall flattening, this redshift space distortions. And then this uh, thing here, this is that ring uh, that excess uh, of clustering at 150 megaparsecs. Uh, and the reason, if, if we had no redshift space distortions, then this would be a perfect circle. Uh, but redshift space distortions uh, are uh, changing the relative amplitude uh, as a function of angle. So uh, this was the detection from uh, the first year, first year of data. Uh, this is this R squared psi of R. There's the peak. It's very clearly detected. You can centroid it. Um, and then this is a more recent analysis. So now this is showing the correlation function for separations that are transverse to the line of sight and along the line of sight. Uh, so from one of these, you extract the angular diameter distance. From the other, uh, you extract the Hubble parameter. And then you can use that for various cosmological constraints. Um, and the, uh, I'll just show you one particular application of those. Uh, that comes back to something we were talking about the first day about the Hubble parameter. Okay. So if we take uh, the lambda CDM model with Planck parameters, uh, this is what the Hubble constant ought to be, uh, 67 plus or minus uh, about 1. And these are several different measurements uh, from Hubble Space Telescope using Cepheids to calibrate distances to type 1a supernovae uh, and then measuring their distances out into the Hubble flow. These things aren't all independent. They're using a lot of the same assumptions and a lot of the same data. Um, but, the, uh, but there are details of the analysis that are different. Uh, and so the question is, you know, how seriously should we take this discrepancy uh, between these direct measurements uh, and this one? So one of the, because of this absolute, uh, these BAO distances are measured uh, in absolute units, uh, if you had a BAO measurement at redshift of 0.05, you could just divide that distance uh, by the redshift and get the Hubble constant. Velocity over distance is, is h naught. Now the problem is at low redshift, BAO surveys uh, don't cover a very large volume. There's just that much, not much volume there. So these errors are kind of 4% from these low redshift BAO measurements. Uh, and you know, there are enough that you can't, uh, you can't really definitively uh, favor this one uh, or this one. But out at redshift of 0.3 and 0.5, we have measurements for BOSS that are, uh, have a precision of about uh, 1 or 2%. And what we need is a way to extrapolate that in uh, to low redshift. So you can do that for any particular cosmological model, like lambda CDM, but we'd like not to be sensitive to that. But this is where supernovae come in, because with supernovae, we get very good measurements of the relative distance scale. Uh, and so uh, the green points here are from supernova data. Um, and basically, what we're doing is saying, we'll, we'll you know, calibrate the supernova data so that they fit that point, or more generally, they submit this set of four points, and then ask, you know, where do you end up at redshift of zero? 
So rather than calibrate supernovae based on the Hubble constant, we'll calibrate them based on BAO. Uh, and you can see where this is going, that uh, when you do a joint fit to the BAO and supernova data, you're using BAO for the overall calibration, you're using supernova for the relative distances, uh, and you end up with an H naught that's 67.3 plus or minus 1.1. Um, and basically in perfect agreement with the lambda CDM prediction. So this is uh, the basis of, uh, this is why I said that, that I think uh, most likely uh, the resolution to this particular discrepancy is going to be uh, that the, the direct measurements are, uh, are just too high um, and that H naught really is below 70. Uh, and the one way around this is that uh, we are still assuming uh, that this sound horizon is the one that we compute with standard cosmology. So the thing about this approach, the difference between the red point and the, black, and the magenta point is the magenta point assumes a cosmological constant, the red point does not. The red point is making almost no assumption about dark energy, but it is still assuming that the pre-recombination physics that sets the sound horizon uh, is the usual stuff. Um, but the, uh, so if you have extra neutrino species, for instance, uh, then you can move uh, both the red points and the magenta points up uh, together with, uh, to, to coincide more with the, the direct measurements. So uh, there are possible ways out, but they, they point you to things uh, happening in the pre-recombination universe, not to things happening uh, with dark energy at late times. Question. Are you using the, black points, uh... the black points are measurements from Hubble Space Telescope of H0. Um, and so, hmm? From Cepheid, so it's using Hubble Space Telescope to measure Cepheid distances to galaxies uh, that have hosted supernovae, and then using those supernovae to measure galaxy redshifts. So the green ones are supernovae, but calibrated not to match these, but calibrated to match the BAO measurements. Yeah. So really, we're sort of doing Hubble constant from, uh, instead of building a distance ladder from the inside out, starting with you know, parallax to star clusters to Cepheids uh, to, uh, to nearby galaxies to distant galaxies. We're building a distance ladder from the outside in, starting at redshift to 0.6, uh, and then calibrating supernovae to that, uh, and then moving them in. So, uh, so that's, that's one way of thinking about what's going on. In practice, we do this overall joint fit. Let me take you know, two more minutes and uh, and stop, and then uh, I can take any, uh, I can take a couple of questions, uh, and then more during the coffee break. So other things that I'm, uh, I'm skipping are, uh, unfortunately, I just didn't get to the Lyman Alpha Forest, um, but the Lyman Alpha Forest is a very powerful tool for tracing structure uh, in the high redshift universe. Uh, basically, you're mapping fluctuating intergalactic hydrogen that's tracing the underlying dark matter. Uh, you can measure the power spectrum of matter uh, from, uh, in the Lyman Alpha Forest and use that to learn about the power spectrum of matter on scales of uh, one to a few megaparsecs. This gives you interesting constraints on neutrino mass, on tilt of the primordial spectrum, and so forth. Uh, and you can measure baryon acoustic oscillations uh, by looking at the correlation uh, of Lyman Alpha Forest absorption uh, across sight lines. Um, and the, uh, you know, I was wearing my NASA shirt uh, because I was going to, uh, to tell you about WFIRST, uh, which uh, now looks pretty likely to happen uh, to be launched probably in 2024, uh, do a big infrared imaging survey and slitless spectroscopic survey. And you can roughly think of w, uh, WFIRST as doing at redshift of one uh, what, uh, what the Sloan survey has done at, at redshift of zero. Um, and there are similarities between WFIRST and Euclid. There are a lot of interesting differences between them. Um, so uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions you have about uh, WFIRST and its comparison to Euclid. Um, but uh, it's, uh, anyway, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you and, uh, and, and talking about some of the things about uh, precision cosmology with large scale structure. Uh, and if you're interested in, in hearing about low precision cosmology uh, that still has something to do with large scale structure, uh, then uh, show up at two, uh, and I'll show you more pictures like these. So thanks, and I'll take any, any further questions.